Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics, a podcast dedicated to exploring how things get places and the people who get them there. We'll talk with logistics and supply chain leaders about innovation, industry trends, and the future of the logistics business. Now, here's your host, Joe Lynch. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today's topic is Rail 101 with my friend, Ian Jeffries. How's it going, Ian? It's going great, Joe. Thanks for having me today. Nice to be here. I'm excited for this topic. Excited to talk to you today. So, Ian, please introduce yourself and your company and where you're located. So my name is Ian Jeffries, and I'm president and CEO of the Association of American Railroads, more broadly known as the AAR, here in Washington, D.C., and we are the voice of the rail industry in Washington, D.C., to put it in a, put it in one sentence. So what is your mission? Our mission is to pursue and uh, achieve the policy objectives of the rail industry here in D.C., that's our primary mission, I would say. So whether it's uh, on the legislative front, uh, on the on the the regulatory front, that that is a primary goal. However, we also do a number of other things. We have responsibility for several standard setting roles for the industry because of the the interchangeable nature of the rail network. Everyone has to be operating on the same standards, and so the AAR has delegated that authority and uh, has that role, uh, which is critical to the the functioning of the rail industry. And we also do quite a bit of economic analysis for the industry as well through our policy and economics department. So we're we're deeply involved across the board in, in several different aspects affecting the industry. Do you do freight and also domestic? I'm mean, sorry, not domestic, I should say cons- consumer or passengers. Sure. So we are our membership is made up not only the the seven class one railroads, which are the the largest railroads in the country, the the roads that most folks are familiar with, but also we have several regional short line railroads. And on top of that, passenger railroads are also members. So Amtrak is a member, Metra out of Chicago is a member, and several other of the commuter railroads are members as well. And on top of that, we also have an associate program that is made up of the supplier community as well. So we have engagement on that front too. So if it moves on rails, you got the guys to talk to. You got it. <laughs> so uh, Ian, before we get into the topic, tell us a little bit about you. Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? What'd you do before you came to AAR? I was uh, I was born in Athens, Georgia, but I really grew up in Lexington, Kentucky, uh, right in the central part of Kentucky, bluegrass region, beautiful area, known for thoroughbreds, uh, thoroughbreds and bourbon. You know, <laughs> exactly. Nice place to grow up. I I went to uh, University of Kentucky for my undergrad and uh, worked in local politics, helped work in a, a mayoral office, the mayor of Lexington, Kentucky, and ended up kind of working my way through that. Went to grad school at Carnegie Mellon University up in Pittsburgh. Very nice. Made my way to Washington, D.C. from there and have since held different roles, both uh, at the Department of Transportation, at the Government Accountability Office, which is the kind of the McKinsey consulting firm for the for the federal government. And then uh, prior to joining AAR, I worked at the U.S. Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation, where I had responsibility for surface transportation issues. Very nice. Very nice. That's That sounds like one of those oxymorons, the uh, government accountability <laughs> office. You're like, yeah, of course you're accountable. <laughs> yeah, there's no shortage of work at that agency. I'll just I think that. they'd be a lot less accountable if they didn't have that office pushing. There you go. Yeah. So I'm excited to talk about this topic. So as when we were prepping, we were talking about, you know, the the, the siloed nature of right. logistics and supply chain. So if you, you're uh, serving shippers, that's, let's call them the supply chain, we have all these different silos. So you might be an expert in truckload and you say, if it moves on a full truck, I'm your guy. You might specialize in reefers within that. You might specialize in a lot of things in the truckload. That's the big dog. But then there's LTL, there's drayage, there's all these other little pieces of that. There's guys who are experts in freight forwarding, maybe on the ocean side or the air side. Then we have warehousing and fulfillment, obviously growing fast. And then there's a ton of new technologists who come in and say, I don't know necessarily how to move freight, but I'm a technologist, so you need me. And then I think there's also so many niches of specialized services. And 
the problem we have is we don't always get the the education we need on the stuff that we might support. So there's tons of trucking companies, I suspect, who pick up at railheads, <laughs> right. pick up at a warehouse where a, tr- a train dropped it off. And you go, I have no idea. That's black magic to me. So hopefully, <laughs> after listening today, they'll have a better sense for how this process works. At least the the, the rail chunk of it, right? The, yes, yes. The middle miles, we like to say. Right. So I'm, I'm going to give you like a, a scenario here. and We'll walk through that. And maybe that'll be a good way for us to educate. So okay. I'm here in the Midwest. I'm in Michigan. And uh, we make cars over here even now. And so let's just say I have some auto parts and I need them. They're made in China and I need them moved here. So that's a high volume good. So I could, that's a, that's a good fit for rail. Right. Sure is. We move quite a, quite a bit of auto parts and finished autos. Yep. We'll get into, when we're, when we're done going through the scenario, I want to get into what's a good thing to move on rail and what's a bad, what the, what doesn't work. Right. Obviously, we're not doing final mile deliveries to houses with rail. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> unless there's a horrible accident. <laughs> but, um, so let's just say my auto parts are being shipped from China. They get to the port of Long Beach or LA. Walk me through this process. Absolutely. And I think you hinted at, hinted at, what a, a complex supply chain we operate in that, that exists today through all the different pieces you listed a few yep. minutes ago. And so the, the integrated global supply chain that exists today is incredibly complex. There's a, numerous touch points. And you know, I think more people probably hear about the supply chain today, unfortunately, because of some of the challenges <laughs> we've seen than, than maybe in the past. But there are a lot of reasons there are challenges out there. And so let's just talk about a, a real simple example. So a container of auto parts from, from China is put in a container, uh, taken to the port in China, put on a, a steamship, taken across uh, the Pacific, brought into port, offloaded onto the port where it can be either directly translated onto train or perhaps taken from a truck, a, a drayage truck to a yard, unloaded there and put on a train in, in the yard there. At which point it's uh, it's loaded up. With, and when you say transloaded, you mean, they, are they using like a, they use a crane to take those containers out of the ship and then they put them in the yard and they're moving them. If they're putting onto a drayage truck, they put that on with a, another crane, right? Yes. Yeah, right. And then take that over to the yard. So it depends on if you have on dock rail or not. If there's no on dock rail, you're you're. What is on dock rail? I don't even know what that is. It, it means rail right out there on on the dock itself. Right to the boat. <laughs> you got. It. But so okay, we 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 load it onto the train. Typically, with you know trains running into the Midwest from the the West Coast ports, you're probably looking at 150 to 200 cars of containers double stacked so 300 containers of goods taken in which is good if i'm an automotive guy because again i might need more than one container right it's good on a number of fronts it's good because it's efficient it's efficient both on fuel it's efficient on cost and it is a a a a a, a very predictable way to move goods. So you're you're loading on in the yard out on the West Coast with, you know, 150, 200 other boxes, and you are running that into the, the heartland of the U.S. So a lot of freight moves through Chicago. Right. You know, 25% of the nation's freight on any given day moves through the Chicago terminal. So you have a lot of intermodal yards there. Um, but let's just say you've got one. So we'll, we'll, we'll use Chicago as the example. Yep. You, you take the... Take the the train of containers into your yard in Chicago. You unload those onto chassis, and uh, they're parked in parking spaces throughout your intermodal yard. And a a a, a trucker will have a, a reservation or a, a contract to come pick up that, your container. He'll come into the yard. He'll be told, "Okay, it's at space X." Goes in, loads it up, takes it out, and maybe he that's another another crane. <laughs> Well, if it's already on the chassis, you hook it up and, and you're driving out of there. And then that trucker will take it to your plant uh, up in Michigan. Very nice. So now, and I know you, we're not necessarily going to talk about customs here, but I've always kind of wondered, I've, I've, I've gone through customs enough times, but I'm never quite clear on it. They, <laughs> that, that, <laughs> the, you're not the only one. Yeah. So that container, when it, it's obviously got to go through customs somewhere, they don't necessarily open it on the West Coast. They don't open that container. So it's got to be somewhere. Where does it actually clear customs where somebody said, yep, I'm not worried about this one? 
Yeah, so it can be done in a number of ways, and often it is that once you get into a yard, for right. example, it clears there. But it can be done. There's no one specific way, and right. as you just hit on, it's uh, it can be a murky it's process. Black, it's just black magic. That's all. That's yeah, right. all. <laughs> right. So when that when that moves all that way, what's great about this this scenario is it got loaded in China, and I'm not unloading it again until. We're in Detroit in my, my, right. so in the old, in olden days, you would load in China, they would load, I don't even know if they, when they, this probably be in the sixties, if they did any world trade, they would load a ship without a container. Stuff would move around a lot. It would get lost a lot. It'd get broken a lot. Get, it would get stolen. Let's face it. Stuff was stolen on the, on ships and, and at docks. And then it would be unloaded again. And it, all this stuff would be handled multiple times. The way we do it now with the containers, again, it's loaded in China, unloaded in Detroit. It is a much more streamlined, rational system. I I told you we just did a podcast uh, called The Box That Changed the World a few months ago. We would not have world trade the way we have it without that box. The container, my dad always told me, he's long gone, but uh, he said when he was young, he unloaded boxcars. He goes, you have no idea how big a boxcar is until you have to unload it. I can only imagine. And, and, you know, when the system is working like it should, you are taking that international intermodal container full of auto parts that you described. You're bringing it into the middle of the country. You're unloading it. And then hopefully that box is getting filled back up and taken back out to the West Coast port, right. so whether it's ag products or something along those lines for export. And so it's a, it's a virtuous cycle. Right. And as I mentioned, we were prepping, I learned this not so long ago, that we have a trade imbalance with China. Now, in the perfect world, it's just as you just described, we, we, we receive something, we put stuff in a container, and we ship it you know, to, directly back to China, and they empty it. But what happens a lot is we're shipping empty containers still. Right. Well, it's and it, it came to, to many people's surprise in the fall when our West Coast Railroad's informed policymakers, et cetera, that they had ex- excess capacity, that they could move a lot more freight into the middle of the country. And that that made everyone's jaws drop. But what was happening is the demand for international containers. So you have domestic intermodal containers, which move on long haul trucks. And then you have international intermodal containers, which typically go by rail. And those are the ones that come across the come across uh, on the ships. And because there was such a demand for containers back in Asia to be refilled, shippers and steamship companies were finding it more valuable to unload those internationals and ship back empties versus sending those internationals into the middle of the country, reloading them and then running them back out for export. And so you heard a lot of concern coming from the agricultural community about box availability in the heartland of right. the country because they weren't making it in to the heartland. They were just getting emptied, put into domestic intermodal containers, and then shipped back because the value of that container was so high that the steamship company was making a trade-off based on its economic interests. Yeah, and and I think what I've, I heard, and I'm not an expert in it, but I heard that we had that that impacted our agricultural exports. We we sold less. Right. Now, I'll, I'll tell you, I know we're going to get into this, but despite all of that, railroads moved the most ag products last year than they had since 2008, I believe. So even despite all those challenges, we were moving oh, yeah. well, near record crop, near record volumes of grain. You know, this is not your great grandparents' pandemic. As you know, we we went on a consumer buying binge because we couldn't go to restaurants because we couldn't buy new cars, couldn't travel, so we sat at home and and uh, drank wine and and ordered on ordered on Amazon <laughs> on Amazon. And again, I, I guess we should be thankful. Not everybody had that good. So let's talk a little bit. When we were prepping, we had a few things that you said people didn't know about rail. So let's hit on some of those things. So take us through, I, I listed one, two, three, four, five things I wanted you to tell us about rail that we don't already know or might not already know. So, okay. 
Well, let's just start with the first one. And you may have to remind me of some of the others that we've <laughs> talked about. But, you know, I think first and foremost, one thing that I think a lot of folks don't realize when they think of railroads is that the nation's freight railroads are almost entirely privately owned and privately maintain their own infrastructure. And so if you live in Washington, D.C., up until last year when the infrastructure bill was finally passed, infrastructure may have been the most overused word on Capitol Hill. Right. And the joke was that every week was infrastructure week because that was going to be the week that something was done on infrastructure. And why was that? It's because the nation's highways have a dramatic need for investment and maintenance, and that comes out of the federal coffers. The nation's ports have a dramatic need for investment and maintenance, and that comes out of the federal coffers. The nation's transit systems have a dramatic need for investment and maintenance, and that comes out of the federal coffers. Freight railroads, on the other hand, because we are privately owned and operate in a market, we fund our own infrastructure. And so we have a 140,000 mile, roughly, rail network. We call it an outdoor factory floor. And that takes about $25 billion in private dollars to, to maintain and, and invest the necessary capital expenses every year. And what is the result of that? We have the most efficient, most cost-effective, safest freight rail network in the entire world. And that is a factual statement that's not hyperbole, and we're we're the envy of the world when it comes to freight rail. So let me ask this. I, I, we all see railroads. You go for a hike somewhere and you see like, oh, what's this railroad here? Those are, those are like spurs, I think you call them. So it might have been to an old mine or something, right? And it might be five miles long or it could be 100 miles long, but it's an old spur that's no longer used. And so it always feels like here in Michigan, they ch ch change some old rail line to like trails where people could ride their bikes and hike. Right. And so are we building new spurs and new, so the spurs are these, the offshoots and the class A is the big, the heavy duty rail. Yeah. So let's think about if you, if you, if you saw a map of the nation's rail network, think about it as a massive nerve, nerve system. Yep. And the class one railroads, the, the largest railroads are the central nerves, the central corridors. You know, they're the main lines where they're moving 90 percent of rail traffic at some point. But as you mentioned, there are about five to six hundred smaller railroads across the U.S., either regional or short line railroads, they're called. And they they connect to the main arteries but they're serving sub subsets of the network. So maybe one line might just serve one customer, might serve one plant, for example. And that's that railroad's job. They take goods from that plant and connect to the main line, interchange with the main line where it goes out into the marketplace. Or, you know, you may have a railroad that operates several smaller lines, but everything kind of feeds into the main arteries of the overarching network. And to your question, are, are new spurs or, or new rails being built? Absolutely. So you're building out to new facilities, to new plants, to new yards, to new industrial centers. Railroads have, have done a really good job of, of working to stand up basically massive industrial parks that are, are, are sites for businesses looking to locate. And they can say, OK, you know, it's premium rail service. And we're coming right up to your to your your factory, and you know we will we'll, you're instantly connected to the broad rail network in the entire economy. So that's happening all the time. Yeah, because when I when I if I was to drive down to see uh, my mom, she lives about an hour from me. I drive down I ninety six here in Michigan, and then I get to Southfield Expressway. I don't know thirty nine, I guess. And you see, like that's a that's that's in Detroit. Just tons of shipping containers, right? And then then the railroads are going right through there. So there's a whole bunch of rail rails that go through there. So I see I see them. That that's probably been there since I was a kid. But I just I, I don't ever think about like if I was to build a new plant. But if I, let's just say what I was building a brand new electrical battery plant for cars. Uh, is are they considering? Hey, I should get a railhead coming in here. Is that is I don't know, wrong wrong way to say it. But do those companies always do like a cost benefit analysis of getting rail in there as opposed to just trucks? Well, of course, you know, it's case by case. But I, I, I think you would always say it is it is to a 
it is to a producer's advantage to have rail competition with trucks there. So, you know, rail access is, is really important to a, a bulk producer, for example, maybe a chemical factory, something yes. along those lines, because it just doesn't make sense to, to, to bring in, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of trucks when you can take one train out of, you know, 200 cars of uh, plastic pellets, for example. And so it is, it, I think it's absolutely a factor of consideration and it's absolutely a selling point for the railroad to, to be able to provide that access. It is funny. And the reason I ask that is I kind of have this in my head and I know I shouldn't. I've talked to a number of railroad people lately. It's not, it's, it was the original internet. I always say it was our, probably our first huge industry here in the, in the U S and I read the book about uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt. I love that book long, difficult, but it was great. And I always think of it as something with, from the past and was supplanted by the truck. And when we got in the 60s, when we built that highway system, we started seeing some places where truck made more sense than rail, but it's not everywhere. So it was, so we want to use the very best, whatever the right solution is, we want to use that. Yeah. And we're kind of naturally getting into some of the th- other things we talked about hitting on. So I'll just dive yeah. right in. The, the, the relationship between trucking and rail is a pretty interesting one because on one hand we're we're fierce competitors and are fighting for traffic on the other hand we're critical partners right you complement each other yeah the trucking industry they're our biggest competitors but they're also our biggest partners because intermodal traffic which is inherently generally truck to train to truck accounts for over half of the entire rail industry traffic and so, you know, we'll, we'll continue to compete and railroads have worked hard to to reduce the distance of a shipment where they can be competitive against truck. I think historically, the, the, the general rule of thumb kind of at a, a high rough order of magnitude level was if you have a shipment that's under 500 miles, 500 miles was about the breaking point where rail could be competitive. Anything below that, it's really hard for rail to compete. Above that, you got a you got a fighting chance to to win that traffic. And of course, the further the further the distance of the shipment, the better off rail is going to be. But railroads have taken a lot of steps to really try to drive that that number down below 500 to get competitive in certain markets down to, to 300 miles, for example. And it's a case by case basis, and it's very regional. But they'll they'll keep working to try to keep biting off pieces of that pie. Right. And you guys need volume too. You're nobody, but nobody Density gets that. Density is key. Yeah, exactly. You know, one-offs generally aren't going to make a lot of sense. Which brings us to the, another topic I want to talk to you about. So what are, let's talk about some of the things that are good to move by rail. What, what's a good fit and what's not a good fit? Okay. So let's, let's start with, you know, we hit on intermodal. Now, does everyone know what intermodal means? It's obvious to you and I, but what we're talking about is containers full of consumer goods. So whether it's clothes, electronics, you know, anything that, that can go in a, uh, anything that ends up on a store shelf ends up yep. from a container. So intermodal is, like I said, about at least 50% of the traffic that moves on rail now. And that's only going to continue to grow. You know, consumers, consumer goods are, are, are the future. Now, all that being said, industrial products, so chemical products, petroleum products, forest products, so lumber, et cetera. That's called bulk, right? Bulk products, right. So bulk goods, by their nature, often move by rail because you're you're moving such a massive amount, typically from one point to another, that you know you can move 300 truckloads of of a good on one train. I, I noticed this every once in a while. It's like um, when you get stopped at the train, I was like, "Yep, they're moving a whole bunch of big boxes of rocks." Right. <laughs> I was thinking, where are you going that you guys don't have rocks? Right. <laughs> <laughs> or you're moving sand, or you're moving pipe, or you're moving, believe it or not, still moving quite a bit of coal. Coal used to be upwards of 30% of the entire industry's traffic base. That has dropped off significantly right? as we've moved away from coal as an energy source for the U.S., as the price of natural gas has, has reduced the, uh, the, the marketability of coal as a power source. So both kind of economic and societal reasons that coal has dropped off, but the industry still moves a, a pretty solid amount of coal as well, long as coal is part of the, the, the mixture that supplies power for both the U.S. and other countries. Rail is the, right. really the only ro- logical way to move it. Yeah, and by the way, I don't know if you paid attention, but this was in China probably six months or a year ago where they 
uh, got mad at Australia. Their pr- Australian prime minister said something about COVID, and Chinese didn't like that. And and I guess they said, "Hey, we aren't buying we aren't buying coal from Australia. China is the biggest user of coal still, right? And but they make it. They they mine a lot of their own, but they still get it from Australia. So they said we're not buying that coal. Well, that was like that you know fiat from the top, <laughs> and it shut down a lot of their uh, factories and. Uh, a lot of their economy was tied to even that small amount of coal. So, you know, when you need it, you need it. <laughs> right. right. So. And one other, since you're, you're a Michigan man, it, we should absolutely point out that we move a lot of finished automobiles. We, we, we move auto parts, but right. approximately 75% of finished autos spend time on a train. We always see those that roll and buy with all the fi- finished cars. So does it move a lot of inbound goods? I mean, inbound, you know, we talked to our example was, inbound logistics of auto parts. Does it do some of those too? It it, it does. Absolutely. On the auto side, sure. From both North and South, our NAFTA partners, Canada and Mexico. And a lot of times some of that stuff will move back and forth throughout the, the life cycle of the shipment or the development of the product. Just as an aside, we did some analysis a couple years ago and I think it was about 40% of all rail traffic was based on international movements. And so that's import and export. That's through the ports, but also north-south through our, our trading partners in North America, too. So a lot of international movements, about 50,000 jobs supported by the international movements in rail. Yeah. So one of the other things that uh, we talked about before we hit record is you mentioned Fed regs is a big issue in your biz. So talk a little bit about that. Right. So railroads, you mentioned the, 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 the long history, storied history of the rail industry. So railroads are actually the first industry to be federal federally regulated not the last the, not the last <laughs> but uh, because of the interstate nature of our industry and interestingly enough even today when there is a federal regulatory action it preempts state action so if the feds speak the states really don't have an opportunity to do anything different because again we move across state lines so we have a pretty complex regulatory structure here in Washington DC we have a, an operational safety regulator at the Department of Transportation called the Federal Railroad Administration. And so the FRA's role is to, to govern the, the operations of the industry to, to, to maximize the, the safety. And so there's a you know, long history of regulatory issues there. And uh, I'll tell you, for us these days, because we are a, a legacy industry, we've got regulations on the books today that are from the steam engine era. And so our big <laughs> challenge is really not deregulatory, it's regulatory modernization, because this isn't your grandfather's railroad. You know, there's a massive amount of technology that's been deployed on the network. And so our, our, our thrust is to, to modernize the regulatory requirements that reflect today's railroad. Our other big regulator, we have an economic regulator called the Surface Transportation Board. And the Surface Transportation Board's primary role is to govern rate disputes between a, a shipper and a railroad so that if a, if a shipper feels that it is being a, charged a rate that is unreasonable, the STB, as it is known, is there to serve as, a, as an adjudicator to determine, okay, this rate, okay, maybe this rate's too high or no, this rate makes sense given the market that, that you're operating in. And so the STB is of equal importance to us as an industry. And then other agencies, you know, EPA, for example, they have some regulatory reach over us. But really, those are the primary two, the, the safety and the economic. And that, that makes us very unique. Right. So let me ask this. So we have this, these are privately owned rails yes. right, that go across the country. So let's just say there's a ra- there's rails that go out east that are, and they, out east, out west. Um, there's not, is, there's not dozens, I don't think. Is there just how many that go east, west, all the way across the country? Those would be the class A, right? Class one. Class one. Right. And really you have, you don't have transcontinental railroads. You have kind of the, the Western big guys and the Eastern big guys. And then they interchange kind of in the middle of the country, right around the Mississippi River often. So let me say this, I, I, those guys, that those are privately, privately owned rails. And so they say, we will drive our trains on here. Do they ever rent those out? Is that ever a part of this? Well, so rent out is not a term I would use, but they, they all have interchange agreements. Okay. And so they're handing off traffic back and forth. Sometimes their train, you know, my train will run over your track based on an interchange agreement. So, it, you know, I live, 
live in Northern Virginia and work in Washington, D.C., and it's not completely out of uh, the question to see a Western Railroad's locomotive going by occasionally. Not often, but, you know, so the, the, the interchange points are generally the center of the country. So let's think about the major gateways. Chicago, as we mentioned, moves about 25% of freight on any given day. It's absolutely immense. The yeah, if you get something from, when I remember getting stuff from a train, it was, we often picked up in Chicago. And I was right. like, don't, and I was like, we have a lot of rail over here. I don't know why it doesn't. Just the amount of density in Chicago. I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But then you move down. So then you've got St. Louis, Kansas City, New Orleans, kind of those main gateways on the Mississippi are the main gateways for the, the class ones to interchange. So I want to make sure we hit on all this. So we talked about privately owned. We talked about the interplay between trucks and rail and ships. That's that intermodal stuff. We talked about Fed regs. Oh, I want you to talk about sustainability. Yeah, absolutely. Important to everybody these days. And I think so many shippers are starting to say, I want this. What are you doing for me when it comes to sustainability? And I've said this many times to people on my podcast. If you don't believe that climate change is caused by man and to, you know if this is somebody else's concern, it really doesn't matter. It's just customers are asking. This isn't a political thing. Customers are asking, and I, by the way, I talked to um, Matt McClellan over at Covenant, big trucking company, and he said they talked to top, their top 10 customers. Each one of them had sustainability goals. So, Absolutely. So it's, when you look, trucking, I think, accounts for 5% of greenhouse gases in the U.S. Supply chain with logistics altogether, I think, is 80% of greenhouse gases. So it's just a matter of time before our customers and maybe even the government starts to look at us. Right. So sustainability means a lot. So <laughs> how does rail help us with that, Ian? Well, you, as we stand here today, rail is the most environmentally friendly way to move goods across land, period. I think we release about 25% of the emissions that our trucking partners do. And both 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 industries are working hard to to continue to improve that. But I mean, it's just human nature. Think about it. You've got a couple locomotives pulling 300 trucks worth of goods. Inherently, you're going to have fewer emissions. We're also moving things on our own network. So we're taking if we're taking trucks off the highway, we're reducing congestion, we're reducing wear and tear on the infrastructure. So there's kind of a, a broader environmental benefit, both direct and indirect railroads. So, so today we have a, a, a strong environmental record of our emissions profile just as we operate today. And that has continued to improve. One, one little data nugget we like to throw out, and this is updated every year, but I think this year's, this year's stat was you can move one ton of freight 480 miles on one gallon of diesel. So that's pretty, that's pretty darn fuel efficient. You know, 480 miles to the gallon is not too shabby. Yeah. Well, and I, I also will say this, uh, and I, no, nothing against the truck drivers who move our stuff. God, God knows we need them. But every once in a while, and out in Chicago, you mentioned the amount of rail traffic. They have a lot of truck traffic. I'm not right. too far from there, four and a half hours. So I, I drive through Chicago at least once a year. And as I'm driving through, it's always shocking between like Gary, Indiana and Chicagoland how many trucks there are. You're like, am I the only dude who doesn't have a truck today? Like everybody's got one. And it feels sometimes like, man, this is hard to drive in because you can't see. And every once in a while, I go, wouldn't it be nice if they have their own road? They kind of do. It's called the railroad. It's right there. You can see it from the highway. You're exactly right. But as we, so, so our, as we stand here today, the environmental performance of rail is strong. But we can't rest on our laurels. We've got to continue to evolve and invest and reduce our economic impact because one, it's the right thing to do. Two, it's good for business. Three, as you mentioned, customers are expecting it and customers are making choices on who they're going to use as their transportation partner based on emissions profiles. And that could be for any number of reasons, especially when you look at some of the, the federal regs that might be coming down as far as disclo emissions disclosures, et cetera. So, we're, we're investing in purchasing high, um, battery, battery electric locomotives. We're looking at increasing the amount of biofuels used in our locomotives, hydrogen power experimentation going on, use of electric cranes and yards, that sort of thing. And so it's kind of an all of the above strategy to try to continue to drive down our emissions profile. And our, our members have put their put their money where their mouths are. They've all signed up for science-based targets initiatives that are in line with the Paris Accords. And so we're working very hard to uh, to meet those goals. And it's like I said, it's expected. 
it's good business because you're reducing fuel consumption. You're reducing your own right. profile. It's good to be uh, on the community partner front because you're operating oftentimes your yards, et cetera, are right in the middle of urban areas. And it's good business because that's what customers want and expect. Yeah, I just had, I forgot the guy's name now, but the guys over at Parallel Systems, are you familiar with yeah, those guys? Absolutely. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so those guys have created, or creating, they're, I don't think they've gone, they, they, they aren't gone live yet, or a car, I guess, that is autonomous and also electric. Right, right. And one of the things I think we talked about when I talked to those guys was of all the, leg- of, you know, all the, some things are very mature. Some parts of the industry, like rail, is the most mature of all these things. And, you know, when you look at trucking, 1% or 1.5% of the truckload market means you're a leader in the space. We are going to have a lot of consolidation. I don't know that we'll get to the amount. How many rail, How many big rail operators are there right now? Seven. Yeah. I don't know if we'll ever get to seven, but we're going to see more consolidation within truckload just because... Again, the the bigger guys they, they tend to they tend to get more advantages over time with uh, technology and their volume their volume allows them to buy better and they let's f- face it they're efficient players. But I keep thinking with rail guys like Parallel Systems and others and what you just mentioned trying to get better all the time. I'd lo- I would love to see like a new new innovation that, that more n- new innovations hit the space that makes it even more attractive. Well, I think it's kind of the story that's never told. There's countless innovations and countless new technologies being developed and deployed across the rail network. So whether it's, you know, deploying sensors and detectors to increase track inspection, to increase locomotive health inspection, things along those lines, whether it's how do we, you know, parallel systems is obviously probably a at the horizon, over the horizon technology, right. but they're doing very interesting things. They're not alone. There are others in that field. And I think it's a necessity, one, first and foremost, on the safety front for innovation and technology to continue because, you know, we've, we've railroading is a very safe industry. It's an inherently risky industry, but it's a very safe way to move things. And our safety numbers have improved dramatically over the years. You just look at the trend lines. They're all they're all taking, you know, massive dips, but we've squeezed out a lot of the low to mid hanging fruit on the safety front. And so it's going to take a lot of technology, data analysis, et cetera, to continue to drive that, that right. curve down. Also for competitive purposes, when you're talking about, you know, innovation, use of technologies, use of automated technology. So there's a safety side to that. But, you know, as well as I do, trucking's full steam ahead into autonomous technologies, battery electric, et cetera. So if we're going to be viable and maintain some sort of competitive ability to, to, to fight for that traffic, we've got to continue to innovate as well. Autonomous makes more sense on rail. To of course me, it does. Yeah. Than, than, than on, on the road. a guideway that's largely closed <laughs> from public interaction. Right. There is no, there's no pesky passenger dr- drivers right. cutting you off. And yeah, so I think, you know, one of the other things I, I, maybe you know this, it used to be that if you had a railroad in an area, it was loud and it would wake you up if it drove by your house and it was like right. the worst place. So there was the other side of the tracks is something people used to say. I don't think rail is loud like that anymore because I think they did something with the track or the cars. They're not like that anymore. It used to like rattle buildings. <laughs> yeah. I think as, as someone once put it a few years ago to me, you know, somebody said the clickety clack of the rails and the person stopped and said, we don't clickety clack. We glide. Right. We glide over rail. And a lot of that's because of, you know, welding advances in welding with rail using much longer pieces of rail and just a much reducing friction, et cetera. Just a much Again, more modern, advanced system. All righty then. Well, let's see here. I want to make sure we. When I want to summarize a little bit of this, and then I want to get your final thoughts, and I want to talk a little bit about what you guys are up to over at the Association of American Railroads. So, down Rail One Hundred and One with my friend Ian Jeffries. So we talked about rail. It's a really good fit for certain stuff, and you said fifty percent of it's intermodal. And you mentioned it's really good for industrial stuff, chemicals, lumber, rock, sand, coal, anything that's that bulk, that's a really good fit. Anything that, And you need high volume. That's kind of the nature of this. Finished cars is a perfect example. Much better to do that on rail than over the road. So we also talked about these are <laughs> the rails are privately owned. I never, I never gave it a thought. I've talked to people on my podcast about rail. I never knew those are 100 and what'd you say? 140,000 miles. 
yes, of sir. rail. Didn't know that they're privately owned. We talked about the interplay between trucks and rail and intermodal, how important that is to our economy. Absolutely. We're talking about sustainability, rail is much more sustainable than, than trucking right now. And we talked about Fed regs. You guys have your full complement of Fed regs, and I'm sure you'll we get a lot more. Do. Yeah. <laughs> we, could, we could spend all day talking about you know the interactions we're having right now, but we'll save that for another time, maybe. Exactly. So, Ian, put a bow on this bad boy. Final thoughts. Well, let's see. Let's all let's wrap it up into one. So, again, today's rail network is truly the envy of the world when it comes to freight rail. We invest on our own. A well-maintained railroad is a uh, is a safe railroad, and so that investment uh, leads to leads to a high level of maintenance, a high level of performance. The American Society of Civil Engineers, highly respected independent organization, does a quadrennial review of all the different types of infrastructure in the country. America's Freight Railroads got the highest grade. I believe we got a B plus and we would have gotten an A, except they included the Northeast Corridor, which is in dramatic need of uh, of significant investment. And of course, that's that's a that's a passenger rail line. So again, the years and years of investment have resulted in a, a, a very healthy network. Our economic regulator is, is is critically important because we have a system now that allows us to operate in markets and act charge rates that the market will bear, but also there's a regulatory backstop for disputes that may arise. And we're really the middle miles of the economy. So we're the tangible goods economy. And whether that's consumer products, industrial products, we're moving it and we're a good reflection of how the economy is going. If the economy is doing well, we're doing well. If the economy is sputtering, our traffic's not so hot. Yep. It's, it's an interesting thing. I talk to a lot of people who say this now. We didn't say it a few years ago. They say we always, we have a relationship with the rail. And they said, we didn't used to. And I always think like it was always kind of off the radar. And again, I, I, I'm, this is probably a stereotype, but I think in a lot of ways, I was this way. I thought it was like an old timey industry. Right. But I mean, I really, cause, you, cause it is such an important part of our history that that's kind of maybe where, it, where it comes from. But this is increasingly economically viable. It's sustainable. It works. I mean, we're- yeah, and it really, if you look at, so we were partially deregulated in 1980, about the same time trucking was deregulated, airline, you know, by the great deregulator, Jimmy Carter. Right. And if you look at the industry since then, it's just remarkable. Safety, cost effectiveness, efficiency, et cetera. It's just, it's an American success story that should be celebrated. I'll tell you one thing, Warren Buffett, who's, who's Berkshire Hathaway, owns yep. BNSF Railroad. I think he, Think, knows a thing or two about business. Oh, he yeah. said if, if he was stranded on a desert island, the one economic report he would need to understand how the economy was was rail traffic. And so uh, really? that just tells you right there. Yeah. Yep. So if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. I forgot he he did buy that. But by the way, I mentioned this not so long ago on my podcast, the Ambassador Bridge that connects Detroit to Windsor, Canada. Right. It's privately owned. And I remember for years, Warren Buffett said, yeah, I would like to buy that bridge. <laughs> It's owned by uh, was Manny Maroon, who's passed away. So I guess his family, whatever, owns that. And and now we're we got a new bridge coming. But it's funny that you would have. Well, I guess that's how rail is. You have a private. You have a privately owned that's uh, right. looks like it's looks like it's uh, owned by the by the state. Anyway, enough of my blather. Let's talk a little bit about what's going on over at Association of American Railroads. What's new with you guys? Well, you know, we, we always have our hands in a lot of different activities. So whether, uh, you know, legislatively, regulatorily, we're, we're pushing out our new communications campaign here soon. We're, we're generally, we're, we're out and about at, at various conferences around the country. And really, we're, our job is across the board to, like I said, to be the voice of the industry here in D.C. And you can find out all sorts of information about the industry and the AAR at www.aar.org. You can also follow us on Twitter. Forgive me for not remembering our Twitter. I'll put all those links and a link to your LinkedIn profile in the show notes. Great. And one thing I'd, I'd plug for those who are interested, we, we do a newsletter called The Signal. About every two weeks, it just gives you a all sorts of info about what's going on, relevant stories, that sort of thing. But for us, it, it's all about representing the industry here in D.C. And, and pursuing our objectives and making sure the industry is positioned to be successful out there across the country. Very nice. Very nice. You guys going to any conferences coming up here? Yeah. You know, there's there's several so, uh, North American Rail Shippers, NARS annual meeting here in Kansas City. NARS. 
NARS, yes. We'll we'll be out there. We're generally up at Rail Trends in New York in November. There there are a lot of different things going on out there. But at the end of the day, the priority number one is is doing you know meeting our members' needs here in DC, and we're focused on that. Well, that's excellent. I really appreciate the education. Again, I think this is uh, still underused. I mean, again, I think probably attitudes need to change about rail because again, I think our first gut feel is like, oh, move it on rail, move it on. I mean, I move it on truck, move it on truck. But man, if it's coming from the West Coast and going to the Midwest, that's a slam dunk. You got that right. There's a lot of it. <laughs> it should be on a rail. You couldn't have said it better. And that's what I <laughs> scream from the mountaintop every day. Well, thank you so much, Ian, for taking the time. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed talking with you. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast, Sports. Very much appreciated. Until next time, onward and upward. You've been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage in conversation with experts in the logistics field. For more details, visit thelogisticsoflogistics.com or follow Joe Lynch on LinkedIn.